Good morning, everyone. Go ahead and take your Bibles out, please. Turn with me to the book of John. First, uh, first chapter of John is where we're going to start off this lesson. If I'm honest with you all this morning, and I always try to be, this morning maybe I'll, I'll share a little bit of my process in thinking about preaching, and specifically preaching this lesson. I have struggled this morning to figure out how to start this lesson. There's a lot of ways that we could start it. There's a lot of maybe funny stories we could give to begin to kind of catch everyone's attention. But I want to start this lesson really with God's word and where, where I think Jesus starts something pretty amazing. Throughout the Gospel of John, you will probably know that he says this phrase, truly, truly, I say to you, he says it 25 times in the Gospel of John. And that's really interesting because if you want to sit down and study something about Jesus and his words, maybe someday it would be good for you to study the truly, truly, I say to you statements that he makes. And here in John chapter 1, we see the very first one. And as I kind of struggle to figure out how to begin this lesson, beginnings are very important. And Jesus begins something very important here when he begins speaking to people for the very first time. And the very first time he says, truly, truly, I say to you, it's referring to something that we just got done studying back in Genesis 28. We're going to talk about that here in a second. But John chapter 1, beginning in verse 49, Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under a fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the first time Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you. This is also the first time, at least in John's Gospel, where Jesus points back to the Old Testament. This is the very first time in John's Gospel where Jesus points back to the Old Testament. And where does he point? Where does he point? Well, he points, of course, to Genesis chapter 28 that we got done studying not too long ago about Jacob. And how does he point back there? Because he says, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You remember that story. You remember the story of Jacob's dream as you go back there to Genesis chapter 28. You will remember that Jacob was on the run. He was fleeing from his brother Esau who wanted to kill him. He couldn't stay home anymore. He was kind of, well, he was an impetuous man. He was a deceitful man. And he found himself there as the sun set, sleeping on a rock. And Jacob had a dream. He had a dream in which... Really, he saw some amazing things. He saw there at that place, he saw the Lord God standing on top, up in heaven, above this great ladder, above this great set of stairs, maybe a better interpretation, a better translation of that. Standing on top of this great ladder coming down to the, to the face of the earth and going up and down on that ladder were what? Angels of God. That was the dream that Jacob had. And when Jesus there in John chapter 1 tells Nathanael, I'm going to show you more amazing things than this, you're going to see angels of God ascending and descending, not on a ladder, but on me, but on the Son of Man. What is Jesus talking about there? What is it that Jesus is saying to Nathanael? What is he pointing him to? In the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, what is the very first story he points back to, and why does he point back to this story? I think, the, I think the reason for it is really important for us to understand. Because notice here in Genesis chapter 28, when Jacob gets done with this dream, of course there God reiterates to him the great blessings that he made to Abraham and to Isaac, his father. He reiterates the, the, the three promises that he makes to him. And then once Jacob has this dream, once Jacob wakes up in verse 16, he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God and this 
is the gate of heaven. And you know what he called that place? You know the name that he gave to that place? The name that he gave to that place is Bethel. He called that place Bethel, which is the house of God. Because he saw that God lived there. God resided there. God's presence was there. What is Jesus saying when he says, you're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending on me? He's not saying necessarily that I'm going to do some amazing parlor trick or that I'm going to to perform some amazing miracle, although he certainly would do those things. What Jesus is saying is, I am Bethel. I am the house of God, and you are going to see awesome and amazing things. You are going to see awesome and amazing things because I am the house of God. Jesus is our Bethel. And what Jesus starts out this gospel in in John's gospel talking about is pointing us to see that he is the house of God. And you might be wrapping your head around this right now, thinking, like, what on earth does that mean? Why is that important? Why is it important that, that Jesus is Bethel, that Jesus is the house of God? Why is he the ladder or the stairway that leads from this earth to heaven? Why is that important for us today? Well, let's talk about it. He is the temple. And he refers to himself as the temple in many, many different ways and in many different scriptures throughout his ministry. Notably in John chapter 2, remember how he goes and cleanses the temple. He kicks out all the money changers. And they say, by what authority do you do these things? And Jesus says, you destroy this temple and I will raise it again in how many days? Three days. I'm going to raise up this temple in three days. Now, what was the temple? The temple is the house of God. The temple is the dwelling place of God. In the Israelites' mind, they were thinking that this is where God dwells. And what was Jesus really talking about? Not the temple, the physical structure made by man. In fact, there in John chapter 2, John helps us to understand that Jesus was not talking about the structure of the temple. He was talking about his own body. But they're one and the same, don't you see? The temple of God, the house of God, the dwelling place of God is Jesus Christ. As much, even more so than it ever was, the physical structure made by man in Jerusalem. Jesus' body, Jesus himself, is the temple on earth, the dwelling place of God. And that's amazing. He is, as Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 says, he is the fullness of deity in bodily form. If you want to know what God looks like, If you want to know what God would do on this earth, you just have to look to Jesus. Jesus is the house of God. God dwells in his son, Jesus. And so when Jesus says, you will see angels ascending and descending on the son of man, what he is saying is, I am where God is. And I'm bridging the gap. I'm making the connection between this earth and heaven. I am God here on this earth. I am the house of God. But he also, we also see here that in Jesus being the house of God, that that means he is the awesome one. Do you remember Solomon's encouragement to the people long ago in the book of Leviticus? One of, I know everybody dogs on Leviticus. Nobody loves Leviticus. But Leviticus has a great explanation of how we reverence or how the children of Israel should reverence the temple. Don't come around the temple just talking any kind of talk. Don't come around the temple just be in any kind of way. You revere the presence of God at the temple because that is a special place. We see here that in Genesis chapter 28, what what does Jacob say about this place, about this Bethel that he calls it? What does he say? He says, this is an awesome place. Now, we in our, our society, we... I'm guilty of it. I'm a child of the 80s, right? Awesome was just in my vocabulary. Awesome. This is so awesome. You know, I say that all the time. But really, it's, it's meaningless until I see it against the awesome nature of where God dwells, the awesome nature of who Jesus is. And Jesus, as the house of God, he is a reverent place. He is an awesome person here on this earth. 
And in fact, so much so that as the two men from Emmaus were traveling with Jesus in Luke chapter 24, verse 32, what did they say to themselves after he disappeared? After he was revealed to them to be the Son of God and then disappeared, they said, truly our hearts burned within us. Jesus is not a milk toast, mild-mannered, boring, vanilla kind of person, kind of, of man, kind of God in the flesh. That is not Jesus. Jesus is awesome. And that means something to us. That means something to us. That means that he, he is our home sweet home. I want to say that as I was thinking about this lesson, this is the thought that kept coming into my head because this is, this is something that my family is sort of actively focused on right now. What, what makes the home? I, a lot of you know mom has moved in with us. We've been kind of you know, eyeballing houses around and maybe thinking about like, like what, what do we need in a house? What, what kind of place would, would be good for all of us to live in together? What, what would be the, the best possible scenario for us to be in? And, and as we started touring houses, we've looked at a couple of houses. No, we're not moving, no rumor mills, we're not starting anything, but you know, we're just looking. And as you go around and you look, if you've ever toured a house, sometimes you walk out of there and you're like, how do people live there? Like, <laughs> how, you know, you walk in and you see just some of the weirdest stuff in people's houses and you're like, how do people function like this? And sometimes you walk out of a house just perplexed and confused or disappointed or dejected. Like, I, I was hoping this place would be amazing, but it's just a, a trash heap and I don't want to be there. When you investigate the Lord's house, when you investigate the house of God, and really we're talking about Jesus here, when you investigate Jesus, you are impressed. I am impressed. There is nothing about Jesus that's like, well, you know, we just need to renovate that part of the house. Jesus is the perfect house of God. There is never going to be a house of God. There's never going to be a dwelling place for God that is more perfect than Jesus. And so as Jesus calls himself, really, in essence, Bethel, when he calls himself the house of God there in John, I mean, right off the bat in John's gospel, he is getting deep. And maybe, maybe we kind of glance right off of it and say, well, he's going to do amazing things. Well, yes, he is going to do amazing things, but he is calling himself something very, very important, especially for the children of Israel. They would have known what he was talking about. Well, what about you and me? The big idea here in this lesson I want us to all walk away from is that Jesus and his grace, Jesus and his friendship, and Jesus and his guidance are what makes our life worth living. Jesus is awesome, and a life following Jesus is awesome. I know sometimes it's easy for us to, to hang our heads and, and look at the world around us and say, woe is me. You know, woe is this world in which I live. And while you may be right that there are a lot of sin and a lot of problems going on in this world, following Jesus is awesome. Amen? Amen. It's awesome. A life dedicated to the Lord our God is amazing. Let us never forget that. Let us never convey only to people the challenges. Let us make sure we start by being good marketers and saying a life with Jesus is a life that is filled with great things, to be in his house, to be in the presence of the Lord God. So let's talk about what changes us about Jesus being the house of God. What is it when Jesus is our Bethel? How does that change me? How does that change you? Well, first, it starts with his affection. First, it starts with his grace. If you go back to the story there in, in Genesis chapter 28, when you think about Jacob, did Jacob do anything that was particularly amazing that God might have wanted to reward him for? You think about Jacob's story. Jacob was not a great man of faith at this point in his life. He was a liar. He was a deceiver. He was somebody who did not deserve the great blessings that God had given him. He did not do some amazing thing 
that would cause God to bend his ear to, to Jacob and his situation. No, but God loved him. God loved him even when he was his enemy. God loved Jacob even when Jacob was pretty unlovable. Before Jacob really had a, a strong relationship with the Lord God. You see where we're going here, right? Because that is exactly what God has done toward us. Jesus came to this earth. The house of God, our Bethel, came to this earth graciously as a gift for us that we did not deserve. Jesus came here because God so loved the world that he gave his son that anyone who believes in him can be saved. That's why God sent Jesus. Not because we were amazing people, not because we did some amazing thing, even, not even us, but even the children of Israel back in Jesus' day. When Jesus did actually come in the fullness of time, the children of Israel were pretty bad off. The Pharisees were a bunch of hypocrites, as Jesus would talk about. There were only a few people who wanted to name the name of Jesus and follow him in his ministry. There were very few people who were, who would have been considered to be good people at that time. But even, even the goodness of people, we go to Romans and we understand that we've all sinned. Every one of us needed Jesus. And so Romans chapter 5, verse 6, Paul reiterates this point. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. God loved us. He loved us so much that even while we were his enemies, even while we were unlovable, he sent Jesus to us. And God has a good track record of doing this, by the way. God has, a, has an amazing track record of grace toward his people because Jacob did not deserve to see this amazing sight in a dream. Jacob really did not deserve to have these amazing blessings given to him. And neither did we. None of us deserve that. But God loves us, and he extends his grace toward us. And that changes me, because that means that I can now have a relationship. I can now experience the blessings of God through Jesus, even though I wasn't deserving of it in the first place. And so that changes me. That changes how I view things, because I know that this is all about Jesus. This is all about him and his blessings, his promises. I am not the one earning this. I did not deserve this. And that changes the way I think about my service. But then we also see that his connection changes us. Notice again, going back to the story in Genesis chapter 28, how God there at the top of this great ladder calls down to Jacob. I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give you to your offspring. And then he also goes on later on, he says, For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Wherever you go, I will bring you back to this land. I'm going to be with you, God says. And Jacob understood at the output of all of this that this was where God <laughs> dwelt. This is, this is where God lives. God was willing to connect himself down to Jacob. This place, this Bethel that he talked about there, the, the house of God, this is where God makes himself known to us. And isn't that what we see in Jesus? Isn't that what we see in Jesus? How Jesus connects us back to God in a much more deep, in a much more literal way, in fact, than even what Jacob experienced. Jesus, through his death on the cross, connects us back to a relationship with God. He makes that possible. And we see, of course, there in, in John chapter 14, we'll spend a little bit of time in John 14 and 15, but John 14, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. What Jesus is saying there is exactly this point. I am the only way to get to God. I am the only conduit, the only avenue by which you can connect yourself with God. I'm the ladder. I'm the stairway. 
angels ascend and descend on me because I make the connection between you on this earth and God who is in heaven. There's only one way to get to the Father, and it's through me. And then the powerful statement, if you knew me, you'd know God also. You'd know the Father also. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. When we come into the presence of Jesus, when we know Jesus, as the Hebrew writer talks about in Hebrews chapter 4, when we know Jesus as the perfect mediator between us and God, the mediator of a better covenant, when we know him as the one who sees our problems, who knows our situation, who's been tempted in every point as we are yet without sin, when we see Jesus that way, we see him as the one who connects us to God. And having a relationship with him means we have a relationship with God. No other way to have that relationship except through Jesus. That's encouraging. I, I, I hope... I hope this is not a depressing lesson for any, everyone. I hope this is an encouraging lesson. I hope that when we see that we have a relationship with Jesus, it means that we have, we have a relationship with God the Father. And he's the only way to do that. He's the only way to have that. So his connection, the way that he presents himself, the way that he opens up that relationship to us, that changes our lives too. And then finally, his direction changes. You know, it's, it's easy maybe to ignore this last point. But if you go back to, to Genesis chapter 28, I think it's important for us to see that God was directing Jacob to live a certain way, to do certain things, to be a certain kind of man, to live by faith. God, in those promises that he made to him, God, in, in his promise to be with him, wasn't just giving Jacob license to, to live however he wanted. He expected Jacob to be a certain kind of man, to be, to be consistent with the faith of his father Abraham and the faith of his father Isaac. He wanted him to be a man of faith. And Jesus wants us to be men and women of faith today too. And that faith isn't just a, a, a general belief that God exists and that his son exists, but that faith leads us to action just like it did with those those many, many people throughout the Old Testament that we can read about. John chapter 14, again, there in verse 23, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Man, this is powerful. Thinking about Jesus as our Bethel, we're thinking about how he, how he gives us access. But, but how does he give us access if we follow his word? If we follow his word, if we keep his word, my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Here's the amazing thing. I don't have a key. I, I never carry keys. If I, imagine I had a key. We have a key to the house of God. We all have a key to the house of God and that key is our obedience. That key was graciously given to us. We never earned that key, but we have the ability to have a relationship with God through our obedience. When we keep his word, we can be in that house. God and his son Jesus will make their dwelling place with us. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine but the fathers who sent me. And I love this point too, that Jesus is not pointing to himself and saying, I'm the one making all these rules. What Jesus is pointing to is he's saying, God is the, is the one who's making these rules. God is the one who expects you to live a certain way. God is the one who expects you to follow what I say. And Jesus is saying, if you don't love me, well, then you're not going to listen to me. You're not going to follow me. And then by extension, you're not going to have a relationship with me or my father. And that's powerful. That's powerful because we now have direction for our life. We now have purpose in our life. We know that whatever Jesus says, that's what we're going to do. Because if we don't follow Jesus, we don't love Jesus, and we will not have a relationship with the father through him. We'll be separated from the father. We'll be separated from his son. Just like Jesus talked about there in John chapter 15, or John chapter 15, about the vine. Remember how we cannot exist as branches disconnected from the vine. 
We cannot exist unless we are connected to the Father through his son Jesus. We cannot exist. We do not function. Our life means nothing if we don't have Jesus there to connect us back to the Father. And we get connected by following what he says. We get connected by getting in line and listening to the Lord God because that is the key that helps us have that relationship, have that intimacy, have that connection back to the Father. Now you see what Jesus is talking about here. Right off the bat in John chapter 1, he's saying, look, you know, I told you, Nathaniel, that you were going to see amazing things. I, I, I said, hey, I saw you sitting there under the fig tree, and that was enough for you to believe. And I, and I think Jesus was impressed by his, by his belief there. But Jesus goes a step further, and he says, you're going to see deeper things. You're going to see more important things. You're going to have more of a reason to believe in me. Not only because you're going to see amazing things, but you're going to come to some amazing understandings of truth. Some awesome realizations of truth that I am the house of God here on this earth. And you can have a relationship with God through me. Isn't that impressive? Isn't that amazing? that we can have a relationship with God through his son. I know we think about Jesus, we think about his sacrifice, we think about all the things that are related to and connected to his gospel, but if you just kind of strip it all away and you see that Jesus is the house of God on this earth, that's incredible. And oh, by the way, when you have a relationship with God, when you have a relationship with his son, you dwell in that house too. You dwell in the house of God too. You are temples of the Lord God here on earth. There's a whole other lesson in that. Not only is Jesus our temple, he is the house of God, but by extension, he allows us to be filled with his spirit. He allows us to follow him and live like him and be treated just like an adopted son as he is in the father's house. It's amazing stuff. Being a Christian is awesome. If you get nothing else out of this lesson, I want you to walk out and think about for the rest of the week that being a Christian is awesome. And if you're not a Christian, then you don't have that kind of deep, meaningful, connected life. You don't have that kind of peace that surpasses all understanding. You, you're wandering aimlessly, like Jacob would have been had God not come to him. You are wandering aimlessly without taking advantage of that grace that God extends in Jesus Christ. And if you're ready to give your life to the Lord by repenting of your sins, confessing his great name before men, and being baptized, we'd love to help you with that. Please come as we stand and sing.